Welcome to the only Danish podcast about pro wrestling. And this is a very, very unique journey that I'm going to take you on because I'm going to take you on a travel, a travel into the world of Rika Wildly, Barker of the Bizarre. And normally I'm doing the introductions to where, which town he comes from, but as this character says, he's from your town. So welcome, Rika Wildly. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It is a blessing to be able to come upon your podcast. I have always been a fan of far off podcasts from where I am, and I enjoy seeing people like you reach out to people like me and make it known to the world that the Barker of the Bazaar exists. So thank you for having me on. But you are <laughs> more than welcome because we would like to take our listeners to parts unknown and this is really some parts that they have never been on or never listened to before so who is Rika wildly well that's a story that i have to start as i was young i was eight years old when i fell in love with professional wrestling and traveling my time as i grew up here there and far i only fell in love with it that much more because it drew me each and every week to the squared circle knowing that that's what i wanted to do with my life that's the direction i wanted to go so the barker of the bazaar slowly grew into an adult and became a professional wrestler in in the united states but the fact is the barker of the bazaar is a carnival barker i travel from town to town i give back to the fans i draw them near and dear with my lights of bright and everyone knows when i step inside the ring the lights always shine brightest at match time that is who the barker of the bazaar is <laughs> oh very very interesting but that barker is didn't you feel at first a little bit misunderstood? Oh, most definitely. Nobody understood the gimmick. Nobody understood the character. But see, what people, especially the newer generations, really don't understand is that pro wrestling, the pro wrestling that you know and love, that you see on your screen every Monday, started at the carnival. It was a sideshow attraction way back when. It started here where I am. It started as a sideshow attraction, seeing two luxurious characters face each other and do what they do best and captivate the audience. So with that said, I thought about bringing it right back home to where it all began, the carnival. And that is what I have done. <laughs> so it Oh, very, very interesting. But could you tell us a little bit more about your background story? Because you just gave us a little glimpse of it. But I would really love to know much more because it's so fascinating. Yes, yes, yes. yes. So um, let's see. In 2019, I had the opportunity. Actually, in 2012, I had the opportunity to go and become a professional wrestler. And it didn't happened then i went some financial you know things happened and it just wasn't the plan then but fast forward to 2020 and me and my wife had just got married we were in cancun mexico on our honeymoon and i looked over at her we're sitting on the balcony we're feeding the birds we're having the most you know storybook romantic situation going on and i look over at her and i say hey what would you think about me really really chasing this pro wrestling dream because i was 30 at the time and you know at that age it's not something that most 30 year olds go hey i want to start getting beat up for a living you know it's like <laughs> <laughs> you know but i asked her what she thought about it and she was like look if you genuinely have it in your heart to to chase that dream then who am i to stop you you know and she has been one of my biggest supporters throughout this whole journey but I, I was going to go to the uh, state over from me, which is Texas, and I was going to go to one of their schools, which is like five or six hours away, one-way trip. 
and um, I was going to go over there and join their academy and, and get my license and all of that good stuff. And I was kind of balancing finances to see what I could swing and everything. And not 30 minutes after that, I had two of my very good buddies. One is my best friend, Timmy Renz, AKA landfill. And the other one is, um, Brandon Randall, AKA Logan Wade. And they messaged me on Facebook and was like, Hey, did you know there's a wrestling school that just opened up like 15, 20 minutes up the road? And I was like, there's no way. I was like, there's, there's no, if, if there was a wrestling school, I would know about it. I'm like the biggest wrestling fan in my area and I always have been, but, um, they messaged me and I looked them up on Facebook and they had just opened their doors. This is during COVID when everything was going on with that. And, uh, they had just opened their doors and me, Logan Wade and, uh, three or four other guys was the first group to go through that school and get our licenses once I got back to the States from Mexico, um, I went and sat down with the uh, booker of the, the whole UWE, United Wrestling Entertainment Academy. I, I went and sat down with him, me and these other guys, and um, we all signed up for the school. And the rest has been a uphill journey, I can say, but amazing nonetheless. So that's how Rick Wildly came to be on your screen now. There okay. you go. That's fantastic. <laughs> but but Rick, can you indulge us a little bit about how you develop your wrestling style at the wrestling school? But one thing is being a wrestler. You have to have yes. this unique style of wrestling. Well, it's one of those things, you know, there's been a billion clown gimmicks. Okay. But I don't <laughs> consider myself the average clown, like Doink the Clown back in the day and all of that kind of stuff. That's why instead of calling myself Rick of the Clown, I call myself the Barker of the Bazaar because I'm more of a carnival barker than I am a clown. And when I get in the ring and the audience is already just like wowed because of the lights and the mask and the whole nine, um, I get in the ring and I, and I, I say my style is more like old school Eddie Guerrero. You know, that is what I kind of style my stuff after because he is one of my biggest inspirations, him, RVD. There's a couple more, but they're my biggest inspiration. So in ring, that is who I style myself after. And um, to give back to the audience and show them that I can technically wrestle, but I also can do my flippy acrobatic type stuff to get over with the crowd, depending on who I'm in front of and this, that, and the other. But it just makes me happy to be able to get into the ring and perform for these people and give them everything that I can at 34 years old. So there you go. Okay. Quite interesting because going from the inspiration of Eddie Guerrero, RVD and so on. So could you take us a little bit forward in your career and tell us about the first match, the first match when you stepped into the squared circle. Who? Yes. The very first match I had was against Punk Sinister and X Storms, the Dread Express before the Dread Express, but it was Rico Wildly. And at the time he was the hateful one, Cody Hawkins, and we tag team together. And I went in and was my heart was beating out of my chest. I'm sitting behind the curtain. I'm waiting for my music to hit. And when it finally hit and I got to step through the curtain and they got to see this is before the lights. All I had was my jacket, my mask and my top hat. And I go out there and the audience is captivated. They're you know, wondering what they're going to see from a character such as me. And I get out there. And I take my bumps and I do my moves and I and I end up stealing the show. And and it just that right there cemented what I wanted to be a hundred percent. Wrestling has always been there on the forefront, but once I got that adrenaline rush and that little bite from the audience and, and I got it sunk into my soul, I knew that day that I was like, this is it. This is all I want to do. This is where I want my heart to set for the rest of my life. Or at least as long as I can, because I don't know how long my body's going to be able to take it. <laughs> you never know about your body. But, <laughs> but Rick, if, if we, you could tell us a little bit more about some of the other matches 
that have uh, shaped your career as the Barker of the Bizarre? Oh yes. Well, one of my favorite matches and the most hardcore match that I've ever had was a Singapore Cane match in Center Texas against the Gatekeeper. Okay, oh. so. Me and him have had a five match rivalry so far. We went against each other five different times. Matter of fact, we're going against each other again in Fort Smith, Arkansas, February 10th. So it'll be our sixth match. And me and him have had a deep set rivalry for a long time. And he is one of my best opponents that I've ever went against because Every time I think I can get one over on him, he always pulls a quick one. He always shows me something that I didn't know about myself, along with his style. So you have people like Gatekeeper that has helped carve who the Barker is, because I always got to pull out something new from my bag of tricks to get over on the Gatekeeper. But there's also been other matches that I went like I went all the way to Ohio and I wrestled for uh, I wrestled at the Gathering of the Juggalos. Um, which oh. is for the band ICP, um, Insane Clown Posse. They are a huge band over <laughs> here in the states. They I don't know how far out they reach, but um, they have put on a five day concert similar to Woodstock, oh. and um, yeah, and they have a big wrestling event up there. And there was thirty men that got chose out of all the tryouts, which there was a lot of different tryouts. And um, I was one of the thirty, and in twenty twenty two, they got picked. And went up there, and there was like sixteen, seventeen thousand people, I believe, that was at that event, and that's the biggest crowd I've ever been in front of, and it was just mind blowing, mind blowing. But um, but why did you get picked by that uh, out of all the the other wrestlers? What was well, it that um, they said was, we want Rick? There was tryouts. There was tryouts oh. that um, they went up there, they paired everybody up. Because like I said, there was a lot of different guys. They only chose 30. Um, they paired everybody up, and they had spectators outside that was looking at your wrestling style, looking at how fluid you was in the ring, looking at your gimmick, looking at what would get over with the fans, especially in a place like that and everything. And I guess they just liked what they saw as far as how you know active I was in the ring, not only mm -hmm. with my moves but with the crowd as well, you know. And 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 I guess that's one of the reasons I ended up getting chose for the 30 man battle royal at Bloody Mania 2022. So how was that battle royal? How did it Whew. went? It um yeah. well, you know, usually a battle royal or something of the sort, like a Royal Rumble type situation, they usually come out one at a time every 90 seconds. You get another opponent come out. This is not the way that one was ran. They put all 30 men in the ring at one time. There was 30 Whoa. men inside the ring at one time, and they just said, ring the bell. Go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was wild, man. It was definitely wild, no pun intended. But it was one of those situations that you just got to kind of roll with the punches, and there was no, no real talk before the match happened. It was just like, here's something that they want to do during the match. Here's something that this guy wants to do during the match. But overall... Stay in until you feel ne it deemed necessary to go out. They, you know, they already had everything set in place as far as what yeah. is behind the curtain, but um, they they let everybody kind of have their own little moment in front of the crowd, their own little situation in front of the crowd to make sure that the fans remembered your gimmick and your character. So it gave everybody a little highlight during the match, which was great. So how did the fans react to you? How did uh, well, you interact with them? At this time, luckily, uh, they they enjoyed the gimmick. I mean, I didn't hear any negative comments or anything like that. They enjoyed what they saw, but I didn't get to have an entrance. So, see, I only wear this, you know, the lights and the top hat and all that for my entrance. You know, I oh, take it off yeah. when I get in the ring. I don't wrestle with it on. Um, so seeing as they just put us in the ring and was like, ring the bell, let's go. I didn't get to have an entrance, so I didn't get to wear my lights out. I didn't get to wear my top hat out. I just come out in my tights, my boots, my shirt, and that was it. And they said go, and we went. <laughs> so, so but, I mean, but the Rick, fans loved it. 
Yeah, but Ricky, let's talk a little bit about your character now, because as you were just telling, the the outfit, the hat, everything is so important for your entrance. So important Very for so. the the audience to to react to you. So how do you use that? Well, that's the thing about having a gimmick as bright as mine and as just kind of over the top as mine is. Um, when I come out through the curtain, they automatically are drew to the character strictly because you can't miss the lights. You know, I, look at me. I'm, I'm, I'm a walking light show. So, yeah. I mean, they can't miss it. They already get involved with my character from the from the curtain to curtain, whether I go in there and I have an amazing match or I go in there and I have a crap match and it just is a botch fest. God forbid, I don't want that to happen. But even if it's not the best match in the world, they're going to remember the guy with the lights. You know, they're yeah. I, I'm going to leave them with the memory every single time, regardless of how the match goes. And that's what I want. I'm going to be stuck when they're driving home at nighttime and they're after the show and they're talking about everything that they saw, the kids, the wife, the husband, everybody, they're going to go, what about that one guy with the lights? <laughs> that's exactly. That's what I want. Captivation, so, not just in the rain, but out as well. So how, how would you react if uh, the audience does not uh, react to you the way you, they are supposed to how do you handle that situation see i'm open-minded enough to understand that everybody's not going to get the gimmick everybody's not going to get behind it you know that's the way wrestling works you've got some that really really dig it and you got some that are just like eh you know it's whatever but the fact of the matter is whether you're cheering me whether you're booing me whether you're sitting on your hands and just waving them in the air or whatever you're reacting and that's all I want. I don't want you sitting there listening to crickets. You know what I mean? I just, <laughs> no. <laughs> I need you interacting some way, shape and form. I've been booed. I've been cheered. I've been, you know, talked down to and all of this kind of stuff. But the fact is you're interacting and that's all I want as an entertainer, as a wrestler, as an, you know, an athlete and, and all of that. That's all I want is for you to, to interact. And it doesn't matter if it's negative or positive. It's all interacting to me. So so now, Rick, we have talked a little bit about your matches with the Gatekeeper, the Battle Royal. But do you have other key matches that have shaped your career? Yes. The I had the Bizarre. Yes. I had a, I think it was three or four match rivalry with Xavier Storms. And uh, our ex storms now. He was Xavier Storms at the time, but he's ex storms now. But um, he was the UWE light heavyweight champion for got to be over a year. And um, me and him had a long fought rivalry to where every time we went against each other, somehow, some way, I was getting the one up, or I was sneaking a win, or I was getting him somehow disqualified, or or some way, shape, and form until eventually. I ended up winning the UWE light heavyweight championship from him. And um, in, in Gina, Louisiana, it was an amazing moment because I got my parent, my, my dad and, and my folks to come and watch me win this championship. So it is a very, very pivotal highlight in my career. You know, it's, it's something that I hold near and dear to my heart for the rest of my life. But, um, I got to win that light heavyweight championship from X Storms and, you know, carried on to other matches and other things. And now since I've actually got to branch out and travel to other states and work other places, I've, I've had all kinds of different matches against a lot of different kinds of gimmicks. Uh, you know, I've went against other clowns two or three times. I've went against, I've went against um, scary gimmicks. I've went against over the top, you know, just, whatever gimmicks but the fact is as long as we can have a good match i'll face anybody there's no one certain match that i think got me over in in any particular sense but if we can go out there and potentially steal the show that's all i'm about so it's interesting because every wrestler talks right. about having a good match but what is a good match for Ricker Wildly? 
a good match, and I can simplify this in, in, in simple terms, a good match to me is coming through the curtain and walking out the curtain the same exact shape. Going out there, going through the curtain in good health and good function, and then leaving the ring after the match, win or lose, in the same shape. Just going out there and giving the fans 100% of what we've got to offer. You know, there's if there's five, six, seven matches on the card, you know, you've got to do something to stick out in their mind. Once, Like I said, once they're riding home at nighttime, they're talking, they're, they're reminiscing about going over this show that they just watched and, what they saw and the highlights that they enjoyed and all this kind of stuff. You've got to do something that sticks out in their mind. And if you can do one thing that makes them go, Oh my God, you know, just like mind blown. If you can do one good thing out there to stick out in their mind, then I think we've done a good job. And as long as I go back through the curtain at the end of the night in the same shape I showed up in, I think that's a good match. But now we have talked a lot about, the positive things about pro wrestling all the good stuff and that's the best way to talk about wrestling but what has been your most unmemorable moment of your career until now something you want to forget and say well it never existed yeah well there's been a couple of different shows that i've ended up working that um wasn't up to par with what I think I have to offer. And um, not that it was anything bad, but there's been a couple of shows I've worked to where I couldn't really understand the guy I was working because of, he was, I'm pretty sure he was a Mexican guy. And he was, he was a Spanish guy. And, and, and the, the language barrier there, ah. you know, yeah, the language barrier there. And for us to be, talking to each other in the ring about things we're doing and stuff like that. It was just kind of a flip flop fest, you know, if I could put it like that. And that right there is one of those kind of matches that I was just, that, that I would love to just wipe away. <laughs> just, mm-hmm. just be done erased. With. Yes. Erased. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yes. Not that it wasn't a good match. It's just, I think we could have done way better if, if we could have had more time to understand each other and, and could have understood each other a little better. But um, that's just one of the few that, that I, I think that I would like to just erase from my resume, per se. <laughs> oh, yeah, everything but, can be erased. Maybe it's not a memorable match or something like that. But well, now, go on, go on. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's it's one of those things, man. It's just like, like I said, it's not that it wasn't a good match. It's not that I'm not proud to have wrestled there and all of that kind of stuff. It's just I know that there's certain things that go on in the pro wrestling world. Like, I didn't realize this at the time, but a lot of Lucha-style wrestlers, Mexican wrestlers and things like that, weren't reverse than, than uh, U.S. wrestlers or, or, you know, other wrestlers. Luchas work everything in reverse. So not being trained in that style, you know, it, it is a learning curve there. But it's just one of those things, man. That's part of the wrestling business is you got to learn to roll with the punches. Good, bad, or ugly, you got to be able to push through and make the most of it. You know, that's that's part of it. So so how did you overcome, overcome that challenge? Uh, I just got in there and done exactly what i knew to do and took the bumps exactly as i knew to take them and and tried to stay as professional as possible to make the show go on as smoothly as possible and um tried to make sure the fans understood what they were watching even though i barely understood what i was doing uh you know that's 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 part of wrestling man is telling a story and if you can get out there and even though The way it goes is if the wrestler doesn't look confused, then the fans don't know he's confused. You know, if you get in the <laughs> ring and you're you have no clue what's going on, you're just trying to roll with the punches and go, go, go. And you're not slowing down. You're not leaving any empty space to where it looks like you're just lost. You know, the fans have they know none the different. And that's part of storytelling. 
Yeah, and I could can imagine that storytelling is such an important part of the whole Ricka Wildly story because Definitely. to me you're like this kind of not not a fairy tale but an adventure, a travel, a something unique. And maybe just like not Pandora's box, but you're a little bit like an enigma. Well, so how do you solve that enigma? You know, I've always enjoyed being a character. I've always mm -hmm. said this. You know, there's a lot of wrestlers. There's millions of wrestlers, professional exactly. wrestlers. There's millions of wrestlers, but there's not many characters. Now, I'm not talking about just throwing on a mask. Or putting on some tights and going out there and and portraying it in front of the crowd. I'm this. I'm that. There's there's a lot of those, but there's not a lot that you can go in depth with as a character. Like if you were to go check my Facebook, there's a whole which I'm not quite done with it yet. I still have a lot more to write, but there is a three or four chapter book on Ricka Wildly called Beyond the Big Top: The Ricka Wildly Story. And it is the in-depth of how Ricka Wildly became the Barker of the Bazaar, how he started, how he, this happened, you know, from step to step to step. And now being able to portray that to the fans, anybody can wrestle. Anybody can promo. Exactly. Exactly. But the fact is a character will live on past his days in the ring. Once my body is shot, once my back is too broken to be doing anything, people will still pay to see Ricka. They will still pay to see the Barker of the Bazaar. Why? Because I'm a character. And that's what I give back to the fans, something that they have to hold on to, something to remember. you know. And that is my whole thing. A character will outlast a wrestler hands down every time. So Exactly, but... I think it's an interesting subject to make we should probably dig a little bit deeper into that because as you were saying a lot of there's a lot of good wrestlers out there no doubt about that yes. but there's Amazing. not a lot of good characters well so, you think about so it. how do how do you see this problem in the world of wrestling well I, i've talked about this on other podcasts before but think about this and i know most older wrestling fans, the reason that you got involved as a child, why? Because of the characters that you saw. Yes. You had people like Macho Man Randy Savage. You had people like Doink the Clown. You had people like IRS. You know, I mean, they, they, there's God knows how many numbers of characters that really drew you to professional wrestling. There's not much of that anymore. This is a whole new generation of wrestling fans that we're having to you know, we're having to step to and we're having to let, you know, show them a reason to get involved more, not just come and watch two average guys that can throw on some tights and beat up each other. You know, exactly. any, anybody can throw on tights and boots and, and get in a ring and throw each other around. But as a kid, as a child, you get up in the morning on Saturday and you watch your Saturday cartoons and you're and you're eating your bowl of cereal and you're doing all of that good stuff. Think about this. I am every cartoon character that they see. I am every comic book that they have ever read. You know, I'm giving them something that they see on TV and they see in their comic books and they see in the coloring books and everything else and in their cartoons bring to brought to life. That's what exactly. I'm giving them, you know, and that's what I want to do. You know, I'm a character. So and that's and that's actually so fascinating. And that's why we reached out to you, because we want some unique characters on our podcast. We don't want right. the the average wrestler, the wrestler, a good one. We want some characters to tell their story. But Rika, how did let, let's go a little bit let's talk a little bit about your writing the book the book of ricka wildly the the chapters that you have written until now and uh, well, what can we expect in the future from that story well i'm going to Just continue 
I'm, I'm going to give you some highlights. I'm going to, I'm going to yeah. continue on. I'm going to continue on with what I've written so far, but it's basically just telling the story of how the Barker became the Barker and what, what it holds in the future. Because like I said, I'm only up to chapter three right now I'm in the process of writing chapter four, but it takes you from the time. See in the book, Okay, we all know kayfabe is broken, but in the book, okay, it starts out as Richard Wildly. Richard Wildly, okay, he is a family man, an average Joe. He has a nine to five job. He goes out, he works, he does this, that, and the other. And he has a son, he has a wife, and they end up perishing in a fire. He tries to save them. Yes, he tries to save them. It doesn't work out for him. And this book that he always read his son every night before bed was called Beyond the Big Top, The Carnival Awaits. And he he takes this book and it ends up perishing in the fire. His wife and kid perishes in the fire. He pushes on. He survived, you know, and he's he, he hates on himself because he feels that he could have done more. You know, he could he didn't have enough time with his family, he could have done more. And he goes out one day after you know being depressed for a long time, and he goes into this store, and what sits on the shelf? Another copy of that book, Beyond the Big Top, The Carnival Awaits. He sees that book and it speaks to him in such a manner that he starts reading it, starts, you know, crying and and, and all of that. And he buys it and he takes it home. And every night before bed, he reads it himself. And then over time, he understands that the only way that he'll ever be able to, to be close to them again is to read this book because that was their bonding you know, moment mm. and things like that. And he, go, he reads the book. He goes to sleep that night. And then he starts getting basically haunted by a carnival in his dreams he sees this big clown guy like called the wonder he shows up and he sees this guy and he starts talking to him and he tells him if you ever if if you would like your family back if you want to see your kid and your wife again the only way that that can happen is for you to collect the essence of all the people that you that you wrestle and bring them to me to power the lights of the carnival. Oh. So he wakes up, he's freaked out. He's, he's, you know, discombobbled. He don't understand what that dream was about. He's just like, he don't know what's going on. So he ends up over time looking into a wrestling school and, and he continues to be haunted by these dreams. And, and, and over time, that's how he got into wrestling because now he knows the only way to the only way to keep the lights on at the carnival and get his wish granted by this character called the wonder is to collect the essence of the wrestler. So every time he wins, he takes a jar and he takes mm -hmm. a little bit of the wrestler's essence and he puts it in the jar and he puts it on the shelf at the carnival. And that's what keeps the light shining bright. As he loses, the light starts to dim. As he wins, the lights get brighter. And as long as he keeps powering the carnival with these wrestlers' essences, then eventually he will have his family back. And oh. that is, yes, it's it's a very unique story. You'll have to give it a read sometime. That's just some highlights of it. That's like chapter one stuff. But um, I'm going to continue on with this story and you know give more. That's what I'm saying. It's it's more of a in depth version of who Ricka Wildly is as a character, you know, and that yeah. is, that's what I want. That's what I want to get back to the fans. They'll be able to buy it at my merch table eventually when it's done. You know, I'm, I'm oh. going to get it published. I'm going to put it in, you know, hardback and all that stuff, and I'll be able to actually put it out. And that's going to be awesome. But yeah, it will for sure. Because I'm when you're telling all that, telling that unique story, I'm I'm sitting here feeling that we're just scratching the surface oh, of Rika most Wildly. Definitely. Most but, definitely. But Rika, do you have some... I know you've been on other podcasts, but 
not a Danish one and not one across the pond, across the Atlantic right. Ocean and so right. on. <laughs> Do you have some untold stories that you have not told anywhere else? Yes, a few, a few. Oh, okay, so... Um, <laughs> okay, so like I said, I've traveled to multiple different states and things like that. And um, seeing as I faced a lot of different opponents, there was a opponent that I faced in Arkansas called Chinstrap Jesus. He's probably about six, seven. He's, he's a really, really big, big guy, just gigantic guy. And I went against him in Arkansas. And it's one of those things. I'm not even six foot. I'm barely six foot. I'm like five, eleven, five, you know, yeah, ish. Okay. So going against somebody that size, you've really got to be able to think on your toes. And there's only so much that you can do to a guy that size and make it look believable for storytelling purposes. So going out there and I'm beating him. I'm beating him up. I'm literally throwing my body at him. He's standing on the floor. I'm on the edge of the apron. I take off running. I do a front flip. I throw my entire body at him. He gets knocked down. I hit the concrete and I get up and I look over and I see a whole bunch of kids in the front row. So I'm like, you know what? Who better to help me than all of these kids? Oh. So I get the kids to go over there and they hold down his arms and they hold down his legs. So they're holding him to the floor. There's like six or seven kids and they're all holding this guy down. And I end up doing a moonsault onto him on the concrete. And oh. it's just like things like that really stick out in my head because who would have thought of that? Like I see a bunch of kids there. Of course I need help. Yeah. Of course. yeah help me small kids. <laughs> 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 but yes. What a, what a story, actually. Yeah. It's, it's so yeah. intriguing, actually, to hear that way that you could actually use the kids because I mean, they never heard of something like that before. They enjoyed That's it. Unique. I enjoyed it. And it worked out. So, I mean. <laughs> yeah. But do you have one other story that you would like to tell yes. to our listeners? I will, I will, I will tell this story. And this is probably breaking kayfabe a little bit. And and I don't know if I spoke about this on other podcasts, but it is an amazing story and probably one of the closest to my heart. Um, okay, so a lot of people don't know this about Gatekeeper, but when he come through the wrestling school, he had just beat stage four Hopkins lymphoma cancer twice. Whoa. Yeah, two times. He come through, his body was shot. Like, like genuinely. His body from head to toe was just in complete, utter shock because he was having to basically learn how to carry himself again from all the chemo and everything else. But we had that match in Ar or in Texas, in Center Texas, the Singapore Kane match. Hmm. He carried himself like a true professional, even though his body didn't know what him was up. And um, being able to challenge himself to get in the ring and actually put on a banger of a match, knowing that he could barely walk in a straight line or he could barely do anything because at times he could almost never not stand up because his, his you know, his joints were shot from the chemo. His He still had a port in his oh. chest Damn. while we were wrestling. Yes, he still had a port in his chest from going to get the chemo and all of that stuff and to, to see a true champion like him, you know, carry himself in a professional matter at, after such a life altering thing is, is one of the biggest things. He is an inspiration to me. Uh, you know, me and him's had an ultimate rivalry, but I, I can't say enough about the gatekeeper because if he can do that, then there's no reason for me to gripe about anything. Like, who am I to say I can't do anything if this guy can beat cancer twice, show up in the, the professional wrestling world, first off, become a referee, get licensed to do that, and then second off, become a professional wrestler and get licensed to do that. 
while dealing with all of his body functions and things like that. There's no reason for me to gripe, moan, and complain when this man is doing what he's doing or has done what he has done. So. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But, but now we're actually, we've been on a very unique journey and you've taken us to what can you say far places in the <laughs> yes. world of Ricker wildly. Uh, you have taken us to your town, my town, yes. maybe you, I'll see you here in Denmark <laughs> one day, but that'd be awesome. Now the stage is yours, as one could say, for some last words of this interview. All right. Well, first off, I want to say thank you for having me on. And I'm going to let everyone out there know across the pond, across the world, know about the Barker of the Bazaar. I am Rick Wildly. I am the Barker of the Bazaar. I am the brightest light you'll ever see inside the squared circle. I am the one who captivates curtain to curtain. And everyone needs to understand that I have Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Snapchat, TikTok. I've got it all. So there's no way that you can't get a hold of the Barker if you see fit to. Now, the world of professional wrestling has only got a slight little glimpse of the Barker of the Bazaar so far. But with that said, I hope to make it across the world as far as I possibly can to Denmark, possibly. And everyone, Hopefully. when they finally see the bright lights and they finally understand the carnival and the big top has made it to their town, they'll see just the inspiration that I can be. And that is all I want to do inside the professional wrestling world. I want to draw in the next batch of colorful characters as they see to join the professional wrestling world, just as I have. That's all it is to it. Rick Wildly, thank you so much for being on our podcast. It's been a unique pleasure, a unique thank story. You. And a really good insight into how important storytelling is in professional wrestling. And yes. we always have these last words that we're saying in our podcast. Remember, you have to watch wrestling live. And normally I'll finish here, but this is a very unique message to everyone else. You have to go in and look up Ricka Wildly on every social media platform. And we'll yes. drop some uh, links uh, below in the show notes to everything that you have. So please drop drop me a message with every link that you Definitely. have. So, uh, Definitely. So, so normally we'll say it again. You have to watch wrestling live. Yes. You have to watch wrestling live. Nothing